So, uh, thank you very much. Um, I have to admit, I kind of an outsider of this panel, not speaking about sexual violence whatsoever, but I make my time start, so I'm keeping the time at least. I guess I'm in the team uh, or in the panel because um, most probably many of you know that there is forming a new uh, public art example in Budapest uh, about uh, the um, sexual violence um, uh, in wartime. And this is a big deal because this is one of the first public art example uh, in Hungary that is done uh, in a communal, uh, bottom-up based, also including scholars and also invited uh, international scholars who has already been um, created or cooperated in the creation of, of such monuments. So it's a big deal, a new uh, face, at least in Budapest, but as everything in Hungary, this is belated. So <laughs> not yet ready, but it comes. Also, one other um, hopefully connecting uh, note, and also, uh, if I can, it's a teaser. There is an amazing movie done uh, by Hungarian um, editor and director called Marta Mészáros. Um, she is an outstanding and well-known um, filmmaker. Uh, the movie uh, was done in 2017, and you can uh, reach it in Netflix. Uh, in English as well. It's called Aurora Borealis and it's uh, again about um, about exactly the story we have been heard about uh, a mother who uh, on the way of escaping from Hungary during the 1956 revolution was raped by uh, uh, USSR uh, soldiers and how she deals uh, throughout this experience uh, or throughout her life uh, how she um, denied or not speaking about this and how the second generation traumatized experienced it. So all the things we have been discussed regarding Holocaust, uh, or many of them at least, appears in this movie. And it's it's a really uh, good movie. I I do recommend it. It's called Aurora Borealis, The Light, uh, the North Light, and it's uh, done in 2017. But let's go back to my topic, <laughs> which is uh, personal memory and uh, and uh, memorialization. So as you could heard, oh, one more thing. I'm not uh, in Kursa anymore, not that any of you know uh, the city. I'm an associate professor now in Vat. It's, it's, it's another smaller city within Hungary, uh, teaching uh, social science mainly and cultural uh, studies. So. Uh, where I'm coming from, it's, as you could heard, heritage and heritageization, but I'm also interested in public art and public history. And uh, uh, throughout my PhD, I come up, uh, or I, um, I met with this issue or problem of not uh, memorizing or not heritageizing any part of 20th century, even though it has a local significance. So this is the angle in which I'm coming from. But as you are all uh, quite um, professional in testimonies and Holocaust studies, so I'm going to invite you to look at this whole issue from the point of, of uh, public memories and memorials. Mm -hmm. So let's start with some uh, basic terms and expressions. Public art, which I mean by that, it's any art uh, representation on a public sphere. Uh, so it's contemporary and ideologically influenced. When I'm telling you all these um, characteristics or general comments, please keep in mind all your knowledge about testimonies and, and memories and how it can be connected or how it can be used, adapted, mobilized uh, for your research maybe, and that's my proposal. So, at least in Hungary, uh, uh, public art is institutionalized and it's a top-down process, except the one I'm telling you, or I have just told you about, but mainly it's a top-down uh, decision. You have to have permission in order to uh, establish uh, or integrate any kind of art in a public sphere. So the practice is not uh, just the, the art piece up there, but it's public art if there is any kind of action involved. It can be um, 
regular performances there it can be commemoration whatever but if it's just there and the public doesn't have any interaction with that you can't really evaluate that in the same way so it's more it's mainly about public memory or top-down memory and that's the main question or my research question of how personal memories can be adapted or squeezed into this kind of memorialization. And of course, uh, if we think about memor uh, memorials uh, in public space, it's more about public memory rather than personal ones. At least that's the idea. So uh, just uh, so you know, uh, a few examples. These are, let's see, yeah, mainly from Budapest. And these are memorials, which is one segment of public art examples commemorating um, certain events in the past. Uh, just to give you one more hint about Hungary and Hungarian language, we have two words. One is monument and the other one is memorial. And it's, it's exactly the same word. Uh, it's a compact word from um, memory and the other one is art or artistic. And if you wanted to see, it's a monument like uh, the uh, a building or something like that. That's uh, that's Muamlik, which means a monument to be repre to be uh, commemorated. But if you see, it's a memorial. It's a memory represented in art. It's Emlik Mu. So it's the same word Muamlik and Emlik Mu. It depends what is the, the importance. It's the past that you are representing or the artistic representation, what you wanted to say. So in terms of memorials, it's basically memory that is represented in an artistic way. So it's emotionally charred. Of course, it's uh, depended on where it is located and uh, when it was uh, initiated, to whom and why. I'm not going to read out all the characteristics and sources you could have been read it. So what are the challenges of, um, of making, in a way, Holocaust memorial nowadays? Of course, uh, as you have already discussed in your papers, that many times there is no place for a classical memorial. On one, on one hand, no place because it's already occupied and it's already, there is no, you know, a, a, um, an empty space on the same location where it's supposed to stand as usually monuments or memorials does, sorry for that. And it's not, a, for classical memorials, you are not really able to express something that is that was Holocaust as we know it. The time is not suitable or challenging. We all facing with uh, denials and also the whole issue of uh, memorials are not really suitable, is it the perpetrator's uh, view or understanding? So uh, at many times, uh, this, is, this was the case in my uh, case study, it's not wanted memorials. For example, if it was uh, a camp there, but the camp, in the camp, no locals were taken. It was just, so to say, just the location. There is no locals who are uh, connected to it, there is no, uh, it is, of course we know it's not a nice memory, usually locals prefer to have a memorial that is about nice past and not, or at least glorious, but not something to be shamed of. So you don't have the local support to establish a monument about Holocaust, uh, usually. Uh, and not communicating effectively, you can see uh, these are of course not just Hungarian examples, as you could uh, realize, sometimes it's even not understandable, it's too artistic or not artistic at all, or it's people just simply don't care. So there are contemporary tense, uh, trends as well as we know um, when monuments are rather putting down than establishing nowadays, so that's also an issue. So there is a need to change of how to uh, speak about Holocaust with monuments. There are these issues nowadays in the, uh, in the literature of speaking of monuments or counter monuments, and is it um, need to be a change of how to transmit the memory? Yet again, I ask you to keep in mind the testimonies and the task with testimonies we all have. The example you see is unique. Uh, it's in the North, uh, western corner of Hungary, uh, uh, very close to the Austrian border. This was the direction or the route 
there uh, many of uh, during the Second World War and Holocaust as well. Um, uh, people were taken on the route towards certain uh, examination uh, camps like uh, Dachau or, or Mauthausen. So people were taken through this through this area, and um, because uh, the Jewish community were already exterminated here. So this is a location of the route. It's not a location of a camp. It's not a location of uh, a certain city that is emptied out. This is a location of a route, which is yet again a unique experience. And there was um, a very early memorial stick to uh, this. The wall you see is the wall of the local cemetery. And the monument was stick to it outside of it, which tells a lot about it. And then uh, it was a kind of, uh, I would not say denied, but so to say forgotten during the communist time. Uh, we all know why. And then after uh, the political change, more and more monuments come to be established. And then it was, um, it was uh, destroyed or happened to be destroyed. No one knows, of course. But now it's a whole uh, landscape of memorials. And you have all these um, falling um, graveyards kind of uh, artistic representation became very much uh, a new way of telling the whole story. So I try to connect my presentation to all the things you have already been said. So um, you will be recognized many of the notes. One of them is as what is we are researching or what we wanted to memorize. Is it the researched history as we all have been heard about? Is it the facts or rather the emotions or experience history? Or is it something that is represented? So in a way of memorials, you always have to see what is the message that is not the past, that is not the present, but the time when it was inaugurated. So basically, whose ten points and who is the targeted audience when we see it. Um, if we think about time, as we always have to think about time, yet again you have three different times. The time of the event itself, the time of the inauguration of the monument, and the time of the commemoration itself. So it's a kind of three-dimensional time uh, concept, very similar as far as I would say, at least in terms of numbers, with the testimony, is it the event of the experience, is it the event when the testimony was taken, and when we are dealing with the testimony. So these are the different distance, and also, as you could see, the distance in time is also um, a, an aspect that we have to take into consideration. So yet another common theme besides time is the location. Location is very important regarding um, uh, memorials because is it a place that is useful or, uh, uh, or, or good for the action of commemoration? Is it good to be rememorized or is it a kind of genius lotzi, the place where it happened? So where do you really want it to put your memorial is yet an extra question. So location is important, but you have to keep in mind different aspects. The same question of where you are going to put your testimonies later on, where you have your memorials to remember. So I'm going to give you three examples when uh, the personal memory or the personal, I would say, is really connected to the given memorial itself. The first one is um, an example from Hungary, yet again, uh, and this is from the same region I have mentioned to you, and this is one of the very first memorial for the people. Uh, it says martyrs of the location who were taken here, kept here, and then taken to different camps. And one of the survivor uh, from the States came back and uh, initiated this memorial. He was the financial supporter, of course, and this was, uh, I would like to emphasize, during the communist time of Hungary. So it's, it's kind of a unique thing that someone from America come financed or, uh, and it's still existing. So it's a big deal in a way. Uh, and also because he was the financial supporter, I'm sure that he had some kind of hints what to express there. And uh, he was Hungarian, so the Hungarian text uh, was done by them. And I'm sure the, the Yiddish one as well. 
Uh, the second one example is from Krakow, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and this is from a novel that speaks about a personal memory of how the, the, the region or the, the location was emptied out uh, and the Jewish community had to throw or, uh, or uh, all the belongings of the local Jewish community was thrown on this square. And what you can see nowadays, you go there, it's a totally empty square, and there are huge uh, chairs. It's um, bigger than normal sized chairs there, and then nothing else. You have no text about it, no, no description. So unless you Google it in a way, and you know why you are, why these huge chairs are there, what, uh, then you don't get the point. But it's so strikingly huge chairs on an empty square that by itself, in an artistic representation tells a lot of things to you. Uh, also, what strikes me that um, comparing to the well-known Berlin example, here you don't have any, you know, no one sits on these chairs, no one makes jokes about it, even though there is no text, but there are no lights, Christmas lights or anything. It's just there and everybody kind of rep um, accept the fact. And the last example from Austria, I'm not sure if uh, you uh, are knowing this one, it's called Walking Memorial, and uh, it was established on the location where uh, that has been changed totally after the Second World War, so now it's a living area with houses and everything, and you have this memorial which much rather like an information center. You go there, you get your, uh, your headsets and phones, and you walk around in a way that is directed to you uh, as if you walk around in a camp and you have different voices and that's what strikes me the most. So you have the voice of the perpetrator, you have the voice of the kept ones, you have female voice, you have male voices, different stories and you walk around and as if you have been in the camp. And here on the left you have this and this and this and then uh, you have um, parts or sections uh, from different actors and you walk along a way and then it stops and you take off your hat, uh, headset and you have to walk back to give back the, the equipment and it's on one way you digest all the things you have heard but also you can reflect on the fact that now it's a living quarter, it's like your neighborhood, very similar. So it tells you a lot of things. It says memorial on the text, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's not the classical ones. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say there are uh, similarities between the memorials and the memories or testimonies. Both of them have the aim to keep and to communicate the memory. But of course there are issues whether you can represent individual memories and whether you can have multiple voices with one memorial. So that is uh, my questions and proposals uh, for discussions and complaints. Uh, and I have two more minutes, so I'm going to invite you to Budapest. And why I'm doing that? Because Budapest have like thousands of memorials. That's a big thing, that's another aspect of this whole, should we use memorials to keep the testimonies or the memories? Well, if you have a city like Budapest, where on, on squares you have thousands and thousands of, of memorials, I would say maybe this is not the best media. But what happens and why do we have so many? Because after the First World War, it was a law that every community have to establish a memorial for their own lost uh, ones. And that kind of law kept alive and still uh, Second World War, 1956 revolution, all the things have that, uh, have this tradition of uh, monumentalizing these events. Um, and of course, before 1989, uh, the personal uh, memories or questionable experiences, narratives were not allowed on public squares. And, and there was a huge established uh, war memorial tradition of how you should express all these things and losses on screens. So what happened after 1989? Unfortunately, not too many um, huge changes has happened. You have the same symbols used. 
Still, uh, you have more about First World War, Second World War, and 1956. It's a very Hungarian revolution, so we have to commemorate. And I would like to call your attention that the uh, Holocaust uh, Memorial Day was only established in 2001. So it's very belated, I would say, uh, at least on my hand. But there are a handful of good examples, uh, or at least unique ones, I would say. And um, you could see some of them. I'm sure that you, you all know the shoes on the river of Danube. Uh, the other one, the blackish one, as the Roma uh, genocide uh, established on the spot where the Roma community of Budapest was collected and then transported to camps. Uh, the example uh, on uh, under the shoes are uh, established um, on the university building of my former university, uh, where within the stones or bricks you have the names of all the Jewish uh, and uh, uh, memory um, faculty and students who are suffering of World War II and the Holocaust. We have the the houses, the safe houses. I think that's something we all. Uh, there are other examples in other towns as well, and you could see some of them. I am happy to speak about those uh, in in private. Also, um, for further uh, research possibilities, I mentioned some of the questions, and I also would like to call your attention. I feel like a, a, a Netflix marketing person, but there is another movie uh, also on Netflix. It's a Hungarian one. Uh, it's called 1945, and it talks about the small community uh, and when the two uh, Jewish former members of the community goes back and how the responses are there. I think that's yet again another amazing um, movie of speaking about that. I am not sure whether the book by uh, Peter Georg has been um, translated, but uh, I can say I'm, I'm, I have been written uh, an article, it's coming up about this. and. Uh, this book and there are at least two others speaking about second generation who hasn't known about the history of the past and how how the second generation kind of digests the story. This uh, this uh, book says uh, instead of my father, which is uh, I think a very telling uh, title. And the other book I am uh, analyzing that's also a novel and it says uh, my father in pieces. And that is uses the the father's um, memoirs and only days and and love letters to her uh, later become a mother. So thank you very much for your attention and have a good lunch to everyone. <laughs>